Hello, this is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris, welcoming you to our 10-minute history of the FDH Lounge. It's 50 of our greatest guest moments from all walks of life that prove once again that this is the show where nothing, absolutely nothing, is ever off topic. Well, I tell you, you're a very discerning fellow. Not negativity, not pessimism, but healthy skepticism. That's what I think Fox Business does. We really tried to write and record timeless music, and for us that was reaching for the best performance, the best songwriting, the best sonics we could at the time. None of us realized that we would be so fortunate to still see that happening where you can turn the radio on today. The idea that this person that's running against me is the biggest son of a bitch who ever lived, that's the message every time you hear a politician talking about his opponent now, because that's what you're supposed to do. It's supposed to be like a battle to the death. People used to look forward to seeing the Dodgers in the World Series. And it's been a long time since we've been there. But I believe from the bottom of my heart that this year that will be achieved. I think that Jesus was a great teacher. The parables that he left us with are things that, if practiced, can change the course of human history. When you think of the history of the National Football League, well, George Hallis is the George Washington, but Paul Brown was the Thomas Jefferson. Americans love big things. We love big bank accounts. We love big cars. We love big chested women. We love big fighters. For us to be in a position now as part of this deal that in a few years when one shining moment is played, that'll be on Turner. Now that's cool. The match I had with Andy Kaufman really put me on the map, not just nationally, but worldwide. And that was something that you just didn't get done back then. You didn't get national publicity in the early 80s if you were a wrestler. But suddenly here was a guy from Memphis, Tennessee on the David Letterman show on Saturday Night Live. If you truly hurt someone, then you've done your job. There is a lot of good that's being done out there. I see the Iraqi people coming up and giving Americans and Iraqis intelligence, seeing them develop an intelligence network. I see them fighting for their own freedom and for the security of their nation, and those are very positive things. As the song was being played, my mind would wander to my kids, and I'd be missing them so much that I'd be thinking about them while I was on stage rocking out. I think it was guilt and the inability to do anything about it that fed my addictions. It doesn't matter what year you compete. If you don't execute that race perfectly, you're not going to win. And that's what makes the Indianapolis 500 so rewarding to everybody involved. It's like a kid in a candy store, I think. Uh, Not only for me, but my entire crew, the guys behind the scenes, our producer, director, the entire production team. We must have sent 15 emails back and forth yesterday trying to prognosticate where we're going to be on a given day. 120 minutes, I'm proud to be a part of the history of that franchise, and uh, it's a weird word to say franchise, but I mean, for me, it was all about the music, and the show was about exposing new artists and up-and-coming artists and artists on the edge. When you're involved in an addiction, and you're struggling with it, and you know, you uh, continue to, you know, as a gambler's would do, you continue to lose and lose and lose, you know, it wears on you, uh, you become depressed, and you can't be the player that you need to be, you know, you lose your edge, you know, you become distracted, and that's what happened with me with the gambling, and, and uh, it would probably cost me career. That was the worst of it. It's one thing if they first got up to the stage and somebody goes, oh, oh, hold on, hold on. We made a mistake. But you see everybody crying, the camera's panning. You have these heartfelt acceptance speeches, and they go, oh, sorry, we read that card wrong. Tom and I, we used to joke about it, and as we get older now, it's an undeniable fact that Tom and Peter are closer friends than the closer buddies ever were. You know, not having to deal with the constraints of uh, living half of our lives in drag either. Think back on the stuff she has said about big issues. You know, the elevator didn't go all the way up, I don't think. It's been a thread of the business since the very beginning. The screw job that happened with me wasn't the first time. There was wrestlers back in the 20s and 30s that got screwed over way worse than I did. Some of them were lucky they left with their lives. To me, that was always kind of the shame of the cost is now thing. Is it, it put people on opposite sides of an issue where there really didn't need to be opposite sides. Bob Feller, when he was 17 years old, right, and made the first start of his big week career against the St. Louis Browns and struck out 15 hitters in his first start. And three weeks after that, he faced the Philadelphia Athletics, you know, one of the great teams of the era, and struck out 17. It was the biggest strikeout game in the history of the American League. He was 17 years old, and a couple of weeks after striking out 17 Philadelphia A's, he was back home in Iowa riding on the school bus. Back in the earlier days, the U.S. seemed in the very first 
feud with me and Royce Gracie. For me, it's a big honor. I mean, the show that we do now, it's not anything like the wide world of sports, but just to be in that kind of neighborhood time-wise, it's definitely a big honor to be in that mix. So many people say, well, so-and-so's tough and so-and-so's tough. Wrestling is full, or was at least at one time, full of tough guys, and all of them thought Dr. Death was the toughest guy. Let me quote one of our founding fathers, Patrick Henry. Of course, his most famous quote was, give me liberty or give me death, but he also stated this, the liberties of a people never were nor ever will be secure when the transactions of their rulers may be concealed from them. I think when I look back, I'm proud that I did it the right way for kids out there to, to know, too. Like, not everybody's doing steroids. And it's really been encouraging just how nice everybody is. Uh, mm -hmm. Go to a new city, you're not quite sure you know, how people are going to react. I'm the only guy that, at the peak of his career, the peak of his earning ability, that left the wrestling business and just stayed gone. There's an unpredictable nature to the NFL. Every time you think you have a handle on things, uh, it can change, and it can change very quickly. It's the one league, and it's been proven that a team that's finished in last place finds a way at the top of the division the very next year. It reminds me of a tale of two cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And I go, oh, yeah, you know, like Antonio Inoki's like Hulk Hogan. I go, no, he's like Muhammad Ali. It's a different level than Hulk Hogan. But, you know, people just kind of see, like, Hulk Hogan being the ultimate or, oh, it's like WWE, and it's like, no, 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 no. It's like in real society, like, you know, uh, um, you know, I mean, you know, you walk down the street and you see billboards with wrestlers on them, you know, everywhere you go. I went up to an audition with Survivor and the music was a lot lighter than I was used to. The fact is, succeed and proceed, as Calipari taught us. Survive and advance, whatever cliche you want to use. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny one on Ronnie. Uh, just to get him down, I'd be wailing on him pretty good, you know, and wearing his butt out. And I'd be waiting for him to get up and make his comeback. Well, it didn't take me long before I figured it out. There was something that would happen to him right before he was going to start his comeback. And what that something was, was his nipples would get hard. I think we're all film critics. We all leave the theater and instantly have that reaction. You see it with a friend or a loved one, and you lean over on the way over to the car, the train, you say, hey, what'd you think of the movie? And you want to engage in a dialogue of, of conversation. I'm by no means trying to be the be-all and end-all for film criticism and conversation. And I'm just one guy, and my opinion on film is my own opinion, and I like to share it with the world. Daryl is such a great singer that his voice has become the trademark sound of Hall & Oates and all the big hits. And you never take that away from him because we do something together that we just can't ever do separately. I was a much better heel early on, and, and I was much better doing my own interviews. I could not conceive in my heart and in my mind that Ali could be beat. I believed in him that much. No different than people that believed in Willie Mays and people that believed in Bill Russell or people that believed in Mickey Mantle. That's how it was for me, who enjoyed boxing so much at a young age. I believed that much that Muhammad Ali could never lose. If Michael Jackson was a trial molester, how come there was only one? Okay, or maybe two. And to that, of course, in my book I write that there weren't just one or two. There were many. With McMahon coming in and taking the whole thing over with, I was pretty much through my run as being out there as world's champion going to everywhere. Usually if somebody wants to use Ziggy in a TV show or something, they call and ask permission and then they say, here's what we're going to say, do you okay that? This just showed up. I came into work and everybody's going, wow, how did you do that? How did you get on Seinfeld? And it's like, what the hell are you talking about? And there's no question that we're well beyond a free market approach to this at the moment. There's no question that the government has decided that all the companies, all the banks, they're not going to allow them to fix They've shown that they'll go so far as to take big stakes in them. They've pumped trillions of dollars of capital into the economy, into these banks, to make sure they don't fail and to jumpstart asset back securitization market. I actually think it might be worthwhile at this point to let those banks that need to fail, fail. Jokes are actually small problems. You know, you're giving a little bit of information, and whether it's wacky or not, it leads to a solution. It can't just be some bare minimum. This has to be done better. And you can't have people dying, people from very poor countries dying to build the infrastructure for a World Cup or for any other event. I hope, sincerely hope that Thief is not just paying lip service to this. Rick Flair, J.J. Dillon, Aaron Anderson, Tully Blanchard, all of them not only had a special talent in wrestling as technicians in the ring, not only were they big stars and top performers, but the unusual aspect of them, they were also star makers. The homegrown
homegrown talent is what drives all of it, irrespective of how much money your franchise has or can spend. I've been with Mike for such a long period of time. Maybe both down a little stale. That closed the Rose, which mm-hmm. is the toughest place to be. 